Uh, as you may already have noticed, although Martin says I'm a polyglot, you may have noticed English is not my uh, <laughs> native language, so please be uh, patient with me during the presentation. I normally hate PowerPoint, but I did one uh, in case you just can't follow me because of the language <laughs> issue, so, uh, so that's why I have one. Um, so today we're going to, uh, to talk about how to do ethnography when you uh, dislike your research subjects and uh, especially about ethnography and right-wing immersion. Uh, doing this kind of ethnography means practicing ethnography without feeling any empathy for the people one is studying. And when I talk about my work and my findings, uh, people are often less interested in those findings than in how I got the data, which I have to say is a bit vexing. So uh, they ask me last question on what I found that on how I managed to, to do that. So how could you spend all those time with those people? How could you enter those groups? Uh, did you lie to them? Uh, did you do uh, undercover research, these are the questions that always come back, uh, even when I'm trying to talk about other things. <laughs> so, uh, that is why I decided to to make uh, the how I do it into a real research subject and not just into a uh, uh, small chatting after the conference. Um, if these questions raise uh, often, um, okay. is because empathy is considered a uh, sine qua non condition for doing uh, field work. Um, in fact, ethnography does not seem to be conceived for situation in which the ethnographer dislikes the group he or she studies. Some scholars even think that it's in this situation it's almost impossible to achieve a good ethnography. Uh, the scandal caused by the publication of the journal of Bronislav Malinowski revealing the quite unsympathetic things the spiritual father of field work uh, wrote about Milanesians in a journal that wasn't supposed to be published, of course, um, shows that the lack of empathy is considered as a professional misconduct for ethnographers. Of course, this question of empathy uh, and the question of the right distance with the subject is always complicated. But when you choose to do ethnography within right-wing activists and you clearly do not share their values, you know from the start that the field relation will be a complicated one and that the right distance will be difficult to reach. Uh, the, uh, the assumption that one has to feel empathy for the group he is studying influence also the kind of subject people choose. Uh, when it comes to uh, politics, uh, political ethnographers and in general social movement scholars or people working on activism tend to study parties or social movement they feel sympathetic with. And since most social scientists are progressive people, they tend to study the left and not uh, the right. Uh, or when they study the right, they choose an externalist perspective uh, that concentrate on the electoral support and neglected party and movement actor, especially activists from the base. Or when these actors are nevertheless studies, they are uh, studies fr studied from a distance, through newspaper data, police sources, or official documents that allow scholars to study the right without, without having to hang out with right people. Of course, there are important exceptions, and I will extensively talk about those ethnographies during my talk. Uh, but the tendency, one, to understudy right-wing actors versus left-wing ones, and two, studying the right from the outside is established in the literature, especially if we are talking about social movements, party, politics, it's a bit, we have more data on that, and especially if we are talking about European politics, because in the US, right-wing has raised much more interest than in 
in Europe. So, uh, do we have to jump to the conclusion that ethnography is not a good methodological option researching the right or even the extreme right? Um, Obviously, I don't think so. I think that ethnography uh, without empathy is not only possible, but it's a powerful method to analyze the right in uh, an internalist and emic perspective through the eyes of those involved. <laughs> in this talk, I will focus on um, the particular challenges in researching the far right in an ethnographic way. Uh, and I will focus So doing, uh, doing fieldwork means to engage in intellectual, affective, and moral uh, relationship with the research subject, to take part in their activities, to try to understand their values and way of thinking. But uh, are, which are the limits of this going in the ethnographic encounter? Can the ethnographer take part in a racist action because he's doing participant ob observation? Uh, does he have to uh, say racist things in order to share with the activists he's studying, just like uh, an exotic uh, ethnographer try to speak the indigenous language? So the question is, uh, is the ethnography of the right like any other? Or do we have specific challenges we have to, to face and what are those challenges? The paper is based on my own long-term fieldwork experiences with these two Italian groups. The first, the Lega Nord party, which is a very strong anti-immigrant party, who is now a member of the government, by, by the way, but who wasn't at the time of my fieldwork. Uh, and most, more recently, uh, the anti-abortion activists, always in Italy. Those are the two immersive fieldwork I have conducted within right-wing activists. But before I get to my fieldwork experience, I, always, I will use other examples of extreme right ethnographies, in particular French scholars working on the National Front, so the National Front Party, which is uh, also a very powerful one, uh, but also US ethnographies, uh, especially those of Pete Simi about white power, the white power movement and uh, Kathleen Blee about the KKK. This paper will uh, only focus on participant observation. I, I choose to focus on, on participant observation for several reasons. First of all, the methodological dilemmas of uh, interviewing extreme right activists have been already discussed and Kathleen Lee has published very beautiful papers on, on the subject. <coughs> but uh, few scholars have written about participating uh, observation, participant observation within uh, the extreme right. And second, ethnography is not primarily based on in-depth interviews, but on participant observation in uh, long-term fieldwork. And of course, it's not the same thing to uh, meet with an extreme right activist to do an interview one, two, or even three times than to have to deal with those activists for months or even years. Uh, you, you have to think about the long term and the kind of contact these long terms implies. So we will talk about uh, extensively about field roles, roles and relationship for the first question that arises when people want to do field work within the right. So the question is, how do I present myself? Do I have to lie about my political values? Um, do I have to say I agree with them? Do I need to go undercover? Of course, there is no single answer to those questions. I don't pretend to give you a manual saying do like this or don't do like that. And to prove that there are several answers, I will take three examples, three different strategies. And those three different strategies uh, are free ethnographies about uh, the National Front. No. Yes. So, um, 
So we have diff three different uh, way of doing uh, with the same object, the National Front. Uh, the first <coughs> strategy is uh, the one that took Magali Boumaza and uh, it's what I call an adversary relationship that goes with a little participation in an uncover ethnography. The second choice is the one of Daniel Bizel and he has been practicing a classic participant observation in a non-cover ethnography. And the last one uh, is the ethnography of Jamal Merma and he was doing a complete participant role in a covered ethnography, all three ethnographies within the National Front, even though not the same segment of the, of the part. So the first um, is the more uh, uncommon position. So Magali Boumaza, she plays herself in an adversary relationship with her informants. She was doing her PhD on the youth organization of the National Front uh, and um, she used ethnographic methods and long-term fieldwork. She presented herself as a political science PhD student and she was also active in the university as a student uh, in a student union clearly left orientated. So uh, she was politically very easy to, uh, to identify for the uh, young people of the National Front who, were, who was from the same city uh, and they had the same age. So she couldn't really say that she was in favor of her agenda. They, everybody knew she wasn't. Uh, so she presented herself like that, and apparently the young, f the young people from the party appreciated her honesty. They told her, I prefer to deal with someone who clearly say says who she is than being with an hypocrite. And uh, they respected the fact that she was politically involved, and politics was important for her, even though not in the same, uh, not in the same group. Since she declared her political opinion, the conversations she had with the activists were inconsensual. She didn't show sympathy for their opinions, she didn't nod, uh, she didn't laugh to racist, racist jokes. Uh, on the contrary, she tended to provoke them and to get into verbal uh, confrontation with them. She claims that this kind of relationship allowed her to obtain non-standardized discourses and the, even that the activists enjoyed the adversary talking they had uh, with her. Uh, they found it refreshing and even funny to talk with a young woman who, uh, with different opinions, but who was interested in theirs. Of course, this kind of strategy is not always possible or advisable. But I thought it was interesting to take this example uh, who shows that against any methodological advice that you can possibly read, uh, an openly unsympathetic field relationship that does not mean a failed one. Of course, the major problem of this way of doing is uh, the lack of access and participation. If you openly say that you don't share the group's values, people will tend to shut your access down uh, to more uh, confidential situations, so your the possibility to participate will be uh, little. The second strategy is different. Daniel Bizel, who is now a retired sociology professor, uh, he has studied other subjects and then he decided to study the National Front. He's not a scholar of the right, and he decided, he's an ethnographer though, and he decided to do what he did on other subjects, exactly the same thing, but on the National Front. So he, he said, I will do the same thing that I will do with other people. So he became an active member of the uh, Entraide Nationale. The Entraide Nationale, we could translate it with the National Solidarity. It's a charity group of the National Front. This group is famous because they are doing soup for the homeless, except that they always put pork in the soup so, the, uh, so that Muslim people can't, uh, can't take advantage of the soup. <coughs> Jews also, but they don't frame Jews. They, they, frame, uh, they frame Muslim people. Uh, so Muslim homeless, uh, they can be helped by, by the group. Uh, so he presented himself as a sociologist 
but he, his idea was to do field work within the National Front like he had have done in any other group. Uh, so uh, he took an active part to the group activities. He acted like any other member, selling the group newspaper, helping, etc. And of course, uh, that helped him uh, be trusted and he uh, gained um, a lot of access contrary to uh, Magali Bumaza. Uh, this kind of strategy is not always possible or advisable though. Uh, Bizarre, he was in a charity group, a racist one, but still a charity group. Uh, this kind of stra strategy wouldn't be advisable, for example, for someone doing ethnography in violent groups. Uh, you couldn't just act like any other member of the group if being the member of the group implies uh, beating people or doing things like that. So, uh, Bizarre could act like a member without putting himself or others in danger, which is not always uh, the case uh, working on the right. But even in this case, uh, I, I have some, some problem with this normalization of the ethnography of, of the right. Um, because how far is too far in terms of participation? For example, Pete Simi, who worked on the white supremacists, asked himself this question, should I do the Nazi salute when they do it? I mean, it's not dangerous. Uh, but he decided he, won't, he wouldn't. So he, he thought it was important to have some limits and, for example, he said, okay, I will, I will nod it or I will laugh to racist jokes, but I won't myself do racist jokes or myself do the Nazi salute. So, um, if you do ethnography within far-right groups, you can just think, okay, it's an ethnography like any other. You need to think about which kind of boundaries you are ready to cross and which one boundaries you aren't. And what does it mean to cross those boundaries if you decided to go through? For example, Bizarre decided to return the research to the National Front members and even accepted some changes they asked him to do before publishing the book, which is something which ethnographers do even more when they wo work about stigmatized groups or group without a voice. But should we do this with uh, far-right activists, should we give them the right to decide what we can say or not about, about them? I personally feel strongly against, uh, against that. Uh, another way of doing ethnography within the right is going undercover. Merma wanted to study the National Front during the electoral campaign in 2008. It was a local campaign, but it was a very famous, um, I a very important one because Marine Le Pen, which was the important figure of the party, was on the list. And um, so it, wa it was very important for the National Party what was happening in this local campaign. So he joined the campaign saying he was, uh, he recently uh, became a member of the party in the nearest town and wanted to help. He was easily accepted with the mobilized activists. He could participate in any meeting and, meeting and action, including finances, all the things that are going on during the, the, the campaign. So he got complete, complete access. His cover ethnography lasted three months and then he got caught because he forgot his journal at the party. Whoa. So, uh, the, the National Front activists and the uh, local leader were furious. Uh, in the newspaper, they wrote an article about him and they quoted his journal when he was saying horrible things about them in order to prove that he had mental issues and that he was dangerous. So, if you Google the guy, Maybe not now. It was the first thing that came out. And uh, they even wanted to sue him 
at the end they didn't, but of course he couldn't publish nothing about this research, otherwise they would have. So uh, to be undercover is a common temptation in the extreme right ethnographies because people tend to think that it's difficult to have access and that those are bad guys that need to be infiltrated like uh, you, would, uh, you would be a spy in a way. But this strategy uh, can have a lot of costs. The strategy uh, has an analytical price, first of all. You can't interview people, you can't take notes, uh, except at home, but of course you'll forget things because you're not supposed to take notes. Uh, and you risk to be more concentrated on your uh, character in order to be credible, in order not to get caught, than in uh, observing the other's behavior. So you, you, you risk to be more concentrated on your behavior than on the subject behavior, which of, of course is not the point. The strategy can also be dangerous, not only because you can get caught like he did, and in this case the field work is over, but that can be the slightest problem. You can have uh, big consequences like uh, really being in danger depending on which kind of groups you are working on uh, or uh, facing legal consequences. But there's another danger, uh, even if you don't get caught, you can become a prisoner of the role that you have to play. For example, Richard Michael, uh, when he was working on the survivalists in the US, he was at a Christian Patriot survival conference doing cover ethnography, and a man that he recognized and as one of the FBI's 10 more wanted told him to be ready to join a violent action that he was preparing. So the action uh, was not immediate, so he could just uh, get out of the, of the field, but what, what if the accent, uh, uh, what if the action had to take place immediately? He was supposed to be one of them, so how do you say, oh no, I'm not joining. Uh, it, it, you put yourself in a situation where you can get caught from your uh, role and you can get out of the role without saying that, oh no, Actually, I'm not one of yours, I'm a researcher, which of course is not possible uh, at this stage of the situation. And of course, this strategy raises objection. Uh, the more common objection are uh, the ethic concerns, because doing cover research means to lie all the time. But, uh, for me, it's not the only concern, because you also have other concerns. Uh, doing cover ethnography draws too much attention on the ethnographer acting like a secret agent, posing as a hero, having penetrated the political enemy to disclose its secrets. So cover ethnography uh, tend to be very much auto-focused on the ethnographer and less on the people. And also, it tends to lead to a denunciation attitude when ethnography, for me, is about a, a having a comprehensive one. During the 70s, there was a, a current called the conflict methodology, and the people in this current, uh, they defended the covert ethnography, saying that uh, it's sometimes the only way when you face powerful actors, powerful economic or political actors, uh, to, um, to uh, get the information that you need in order to work on those powerful actors. And this is of course true, but is this always the case? It was certainly not the case with the National Front. There was a lot of other possibilities to do ethnography on the same party, which didn't imply covert ethnography. Of course, uh, 
the problem with the ethic concerns is also what you have in the state with the ethic codes. We don't have that a lot by now uh, in, in, in Europe, or at least in the French-speaking part, which is the one that I know better. In French, we don't have ethic codes. In Swiss, we don't have ethic codes. Uh, so we don't have this kind of concern. But of course, in the US, this would be an additional concern to obtain uh, approval uh, for a cover, uh, a cover ethnography. The problem with these codes is that they prescribe ethical stands with no regard of the context. And um, there are a lot of recommendations of those codes that even if we, we don't do et, uh, undercover research, we are not able to, uh, to fulfill with the ethnography of, of the right. So I think that those are not a good ally for the ethnography of, of the right. Um, but in general, I think that cover ethnography, e people tend to think that they need to go undercover to get access, but in fact, it's not true. Uh, in my experience, it's people of the right are not closer than other groups to uh, study, and even very extremist people like the white supremacist that Pete Simi uh, studied, uh, he was able to gain access not as a cover ethnographer. Of course, they did ask if he was white, and that was a condition uh, that he needed to fulfill. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that being said, if you are black, you couldn't be undercover anyway. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, um, he was able to gain access even to groups who are really at the limit of the illegality and uh, 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 of the violence. So, so some ethnographer uh, think that it sounds adventurous or it's necessary, but as you may see, I'm not a huge fan of cover observation, and even less in a long-term fieldwork. Even, even if I'm not a huge fan, uh, of course, uh, my answer would be that no strategy is to proscribe. There's no absolute answer of what one should do or shouldn't do. Um, even though some strategies may seem as more difficult to justify than others. And what is appropriate or not depends, for me, on the context, because, for example, violent or nonviolent, official or... <coughs> uh, or illegal groups, you can have the same strategy when you enter them. And uh, it depends also on what we are in the eyes of the informers. Because we may choose our strategy, but we have to deal with what the people see in us. So uh, we don't control all the parameters in the ethnographic encounter, and we have to try to think, OK, what do they, when I present myself to them, what do they see? Um, <coughs> so uh, there are things that we, we can't hide, uh, like race, gender, and age, and that means something to, the, to those people, race especially. So uh, Kathleen Lee, she said that being a white woman from Indiana, the women of the KKK, they tend to thought that she was an ally because of the geographical and the racial characterization. Pitsimi had to say uh, and show that he was white in order to get access. Magali Boumaza, the one who chose the uh, confrontational strategy, her father is a, an Algerian, so in the eyes of the National Front activists, she's an Arab. She's not one of them. Once she's not French. Of course she's French, but I mean in the, in the, so she couldn't just act as an ally anyway because it wouldn't have worked. So we need to, to think of uh, those kind of things. Uh, gender is also important. Do, uh, if you're a young PhD student and you are going to do field work in a male-only environment, what, I'm not saying that you can't, but you have need to think what what's that's, that means and what they are going to see in you when you go there and say, I want to, start with, uh, I want to hang out with you. So, um, so, 
what we can hide, so race, uh, age, and gender matters, but also what we are as uh, researchers. Uh, firstly, uh, I think the discipline is important. But Magali Bomazas said she presented herself as a political science PhD student. And she said that the reaction of the young members of the National Front said, okay, you study political science, so you have political opinions, and now you have to tell us what those opinions are. So if you choose the political science card, it will be more difficult for you to uh, play the neutral card, if it's the card that you want to play, because they will think that you are politically aware and politically interested. <coughs> if, uh, so why, why not sociology as a presentation card? Uh, the problem with sociology in a lot of contexts, certainly in Italy, is that sociology is a, considered a leftist uh, discipline. So it's not always a very good presentation. And that is why when I was doing my PhD on the Lega Nord, which was in sociology, I told them I was doing a PhD in anthropology because I thought that it was more neutral. And in Italy, it's, it's a very small discipline, so it's not very well known uh, to, uh, to the public. It's not like in the US, where it's a big, a big discipline. But of course, you can have your strategy, and it can it can work in a totally different way that you was expecting. This was the case for my uh, PhD. So I was saying, okay, I'm a PhD student in anthropology. I thought nobody will know anthropology. Those people are not even uh, the most uh, they're not people who have long studies. Uh, they're not known for their culture in social sciences. But I was very surprised because everybody knew anthropology. They loved anthropology. <laughs> and, and, so, uh, and, and, and in their view, anthropology, it's about culture. And at those times, the party of the Lega Nord they was trying to justify the fact that they wanted to split the country too, the north against the south. So they had a very cultural legitimate problem. They had to prove that the northern of the country, which they called Padania, is a true nation with a true culture. So they thought I was the anthropologist who uh, will prove the legitimate <laughs> claim of their uh, of the party. And of course I, I couldn't I didn't anticipate that and that put me in a alley position, but it was very uncomfortable because they want me to write in the journal, they want me to talk on the radio, and I said, no, I can't, uh, and so it took me a, a very long negotiation to maintain a, a small distance, uh, but I couldn't tell, oh no, I don't share your, your cause, your, your nation doesn't exist, I don't care, of course, so, uh, so you can, uh, but I couldn't anticipate this, this, this one, Although another colleague doing, um, who is really an anthropologist, doing ethnography within the National Front, he had the same reaction. So apparently the far right in Europe it seems to like anthropology as, <laughs> as, as someone who understands identitarian claims. Mm -hmm. So claims like, no, we are not racist. We just don't want migrants because we want to defend our identity. So <coughs> they seem to think that anthropologists are more keen understand these kind of claims than sociologists, for example. So the, the discipline one choose to, to stick with also uh, have effects uh, and uh, can produce things that are important and then we have to deal with the expectation of the people. Uh, but you also have the institution you are in. For example, if you are from Berkeley and you want to study the right in the US, you have really a very heavy uh, image to carry on with you. Uh, so it, it will be difficult for you to say, oh, no, no, I'm not those kind of liberals in Berkeley, but I am a <laughs> sociology PhD student. It's not really credible. And if you say Berkeley, there's a lot of images that pop up in their minds and you have to deal with those images, even though you maybe are a conservative, I don't know, but uh, that's not the matter. The matter is that if you say Berkeley, there's something that will automatically pop up. So you have to think about that uh, when you uh, decide how to present your research to the people you want to, to, to study. Um, 
uh, Ali Hofstadt, when she was in Louisiana, uh, she said that Berkeley was Berkeley sociology was just enough for the people who completely knew how where to put her in their cosmogony, in their political cosmogony. Uh, well, actually, they were right uh, about Ali, but <laughs> <laughs> but even if they weren't, uh, that's not the point. Uh, the point is that they know where to pu put you and you have to deal with, with that. So when you decide to do those kind of ethnography, you better think about, about who you are, what they see in you in terms of age, of, of race, of gender, but also uh, who you are from a scientific point of view and how you present yourself. Of course, there's no good presentation once again, uh, but um, but the people uh, see something in us, a leftist sociology of, from Berkeley, a white woman from Indiana, an anthropology who understood it, it, it identitarian claims, and we must deal with that and try to anticipate when we can uh, the consequences. So, uh, I presented being undercover and being transparent as two completely different things, but of course, in reality, they are not. It's more a continuum of situation in which you risk to fall if you're doing ethnography within uh, the right. Uh, my colleague from Lausanne, Sébastien Chauvin, who is an ethnographer not from the right, but he works on uh, sexuality and LGBT issues, he makes a very interesting parallel between ethnography and being in the closet v versus being um, uh, making uh, a coming out for uh, gay and lesbian people. And I think that this metaphor of the closet or the coming out is very useful for uh, the ethnography of the right. So queer people might be totally in the closet, and that will be uh, the ethnographer uh, being undercover. Uh, the undercover ethnographer is the parallel with the people being in the closet. But most most queer people have came out, and that will be the ethnographer that openly says he is a researcher. But even the people who came out, they often did it with some people, for example, with close friends, you tell close friends, okay, I'm a lesbian, but not with everybody. For example, you won't tell to colleagues who you don't feel really close to. Uh, we can continue the metaphor with the ethnographic situation and say you can come out as a an ethnographer to allies on the field, people who you're building close relationship to, but then there are people that you just see uh, at one meeting or at one party uh, and you can't always say okay I'm here but I'm not one of you careful I'm, a, I'm the ethnographer of the situation you can just keep saying that there are, there are people who just don't know that you are doing ethnography because it's ridiculous to continually repeat it so there are people who know and there are people who don't and even with the people that knows and we continue the, met the sexual metaphor, they maybe don't know everything. For example, you can say to your mother, I'm a lesbian, but maybe there are things that you won't say to your mother. For example, I don't know, I have multiple partners, or uh, I like SM sex. I don't see myself see that to my mother anyway. And uh, if we continue the metaphor for ethnography, even the people who know that you are studying them, there are things when you study the right that you will hide from your personal identity because it will compromise the relation that we are, you are building with them. With them. For example, when I was doing my fieldwork uh, on the Liga Nord, at the end of the fieldwork, I was very, very pregnant. So people asked me. Uh, and I omitted to say that the father, father of the child is uh, from Morocco, 
because I could anticipate that this wasn't the good answer for me to give to them mm -hmm. if I wanted to continue to have friendly relationship with them. So even the people I was most close, my allies on the field, I keep this part of my identity on the closet, even though another part they were aware. So being undercover or being in the open is not two separate, totally separate things. Of course, you can have ideal typical positions like the one of Merma and the one of Bumaza, or like, but in between, most of us are in between, depending from who uh, we are speaking with and, and in which situation, in which part of our identities are we are revealing or not revealing in order to maintain our relationship with the, uh, with the uh, people we study. Of course, that might be true for every ethnography, but it's <coughs> even more true when we study people who are very different from us politically, like uh, this is the case for me. So clearly, even if I took these two uh, very opposite examples, um, the reality is something somewhere in between. And we are all sometimes uh, in the closet or, uh, or not. Uh, and it's almost impossible to be able to be totally transparent with right-wing activists uh, and at the same time being able not only to get access but to maintain access because people think that getting access is difficult but what is difficult is maintaining the relationship for the long time. This is what is most difficult. <coughs> and to build a relationship with that. So this is what I call the gray zone, which is what ethnographers of the right have to deal with. Uh, what I tell, I have a lot of grad students writing me because I have <coughs> wrote about those things and they say, well, how should I do, uh, should I do this, should I? So, uh, I, and I tell them, can you deal with the gray zone or not? I mean, if you can't, I can understand, but choose another subject. Uh, because if you do ethnography of the rod, you have to deal with the gray zone and a greater gray or darker gray zone than other ethnographers would deal with. So th this gray zone can go from actively lying to omitting things depending from the situations. I try to avoid the openly lying uh, not because it's not only because it's morally problematic, but because it's uh, riskier. Because if you lie, then you can get caught. Uh, so Elisabeth Le, for example, she was also doing her PhD on the Liga Nord ethnographically later after after the PhD after my fieldwork, and the activist told asked her if she was politically active. She said no, although she was very active in feminist movement and a simple Google search would have revealed it. Apparently they didn't Google her or they did but they pretend not to, I don't know, she doesn't. But she was terrified during the whole field work that this lie would be uh, revealed in the open. So uh, uh, So that's why I prefer the omission that the open lie. Uh, and of course, there are different ways of dealing with the gray zone. And it's time, yeah, it's really time for me to, uh, to talk about how I deal with it, knowing of course that it's not the only way, but a way I constructed during time and that works for me. It doesn't mean that it works for everybody. So I build some guidelines and some limits of my own gray zone that I am able to deal with. Uh, as a guarantee to the subject, because of course, it's not because there are people from the right that I don't care about my subject, uh, I, 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 I have two points. First, I, I don't think that we have the right to study those people without them knowing. I mean, I think it's a basic thing. They have the right to know they were researching them, we are writing about them. And so that's, for me, 
a basic ethical uh, standard. Of course, it's more complicated than that, as I already, I, I've just shown, because people, some people does know, some people doesn't, but I mean, uh, if they want, they can know, for example, I take notes, I ask for people for interview, I mean, uh, I'm not hiding as a researcher. Second point, and this is a very important one, I really try to take those people seriously. And I have to say, this is not always the case in the social sciences, and it is certainly not the case in the media. When people write about right-wing activists, they tend to use sarcasm, uh, they, they tend to be... Uh, uh, like uh, they use disdain uh, and this is not appropriate for uh, for me. I mean there's an anthropologist who did her PhD also on the Lega Nord and her book is called The Political Idiots. I just don't think that we should talk about those people that way. I mean, they can be political enemies, but they deserve the respect. Uh, otherwise, you just, if you, otherwise you just choose another subject if you can't maintain this line, uh, which is at least you give me your time, you give me access, you give me information. The least that I can do is treat you with, uh, is taking you seriously. And I try to take seriously the things that are important to those people, even if they are the aspect that people tend to mock the more. For example, when I was working on the Liga Nord, people were always mocking their cultural uh, claims, saying, oh, they want to build a, a nation called Padania that's hilarious. And, uh, and really, they, and this issue was really serious for them. Uh, it wasn't at all something that you laugh. Uh, they were really rethinking about themselves, for example, as cells, they send them from the cells. They, this was a really transformative experience for those activists. I mean, in Italy you think that you're Latin and you're linked to Rome, but in this political socialization they learn that they are not, they are cells, they come from the north of Europe. So, for example, they tried their habits, they don't go in the South Italy on the beach anymore, they will go in Ireland in vacation to reconnect with our self's roots, and this is something very serious. They listen to Celtic music, uh, and everybody just laugh at them. And if you stu study those people, the last you can do is take those things seriously because they are serious to them. It doesn't mean that I share their beliefs that Padania is a nation and we are all Celts, <coughs> but they do. So it, it's important to acknowledge that. I have been criticized for doing that. For example, someone wrote about my work on the League in Italy that uh, I humanized the enemy too much. And then uh, I could finally expose the enemy with my ethnography. But no, I made them human. And so I'm, in a way, a political traitor. I have encountered suspicion also for my uh, research on the uh, pro-life. Uh, I submitted recently a paper and the reviewer, the review was good, which is rare, uh, but uh, the reviewer uh, asked me to, on, on the question that you have to answer for when you submit the second version, one of the questions was, can she specify what is her opinion about abortion? Which is you would never ask that uh, someone publishing about feminism or Black Lives Matters or green, uh, of ecology activism or whatever. Uh, and I have to write to the reviewer, no, I'm not against abortions, uh, just trying to understand how those people think. Uh, but you can see the working of the subject in a any way, in a, in a comprehensive way, you can expose yourself as politically ambiguous. So that, this is why a lot of colleagues tend to have this distant, distant attitude, this mockery, this uh, as a way to signify, okay, I studied them, but I'm not one of them. So this, those are two limits that I uh, 
I choose as a guarantee for me that I respect my research subjects. As a guarantee to the discipline and my political values, I choose not to validate my result with the subject as Bizal did. I, of course, protect their anonymity, etc., but I deny them the right to validate what I have to say about them. Um, I have cri been criticized about that too, though, uh, saying that I'm not a real ethnographer, almost that. I'm not a real ethnographer because I should discuss my, my funding with them. So either I'm a political traitor or I'm not a real ethnographer because I'm not validating my funding with the people in the study. So you can see that it's a tricky space when you're doing <laughs> political ethnography of this, kind of, of this kind of such. And for example, the people who criticize me about that, they have, they have returned the study to the Kazapan activists they were working on. Kazapan is a neo-fascist, openly neo-fascist uh, group. And they have changed the book according to the, uh, the, to the to the suggestion of the people in Kazapan, which I don't think is acceptable. When it comes to field roles and participant observations, my, I, my position has changed during time. And what I tend to do now is to participate as much as I can, as long as it's safe for me and the others, but I don't work on violent, I mean physically violent groups, so uh, that's not the issue, and as long I am as I am following the action and not deciding the course of action. What does it mean? It means that, for example, with Oliganov, I could uh, give out leaflets, but I never accepted to write the leaflets, even though they asked me. Or it means with the pro-life activists that, for example, I was doing uh, uh, participant observation in pregnancy crisis center. I don't know if you know what, what that is. So I, I play the role of the counselor in training following experienced counselor talking to pregnant women and try to tell them not to have an abortion. But then they, they told me, okay, you have been trained enough. Now you can meet the women alone. I said, no, I won't do that. So because that will be producing the action and not only following the course of action. So this is my, my limit. And uh, I was doing more, I was participating more in the research on the uh, pro-life than I used to do uh, within the Liga Nord. Maybe because I get used to it or, but, and I think it's a better, it's working better, even because, um, the more you participate, and the, the less they ask you things that you don't want them to ask you. For example, if they pray, the pro-life activists, they're all Catholics, so th if they pray, I pray. And that means that they won't ask me if I believe in God, which I don't. Uh, if I go with them to the March for Life, it means that they will assume that somehow I share the, the message of the March which means that they never ask me, what do you think? Are you against abortion? Because in a way, it's implicit that if I do things with them, I, it means that I am with them, and that's avoid difficult conversation. Of course, you're in the gray zone, but you don't have to openly lie. You just let them believe that what they want, but you never say, have to say things that you don't want to say, basically. Um, I finished. And so you have to, uh, the gray zone, being in the gray zone, meaning accepting this ambiguity and to let them believe that in a way you're not an enemy. Because otherwise, frankly, why should people tolerate my presence on the long term if they think that I am also presence? I wouldn't if I, I was then. So you can't just because you want, don't want to lose your political virginity, just stand there and send an image of negativity all, all, all the time. And at, as a last point, um, 
what I also advise people to do is, is to find an acceptable presentation of your project because you can't avoid a question because you participate, but you can't avoid the first question that people ask you is what are you doing here, what are you studying, what do you want? Uh, so you have to think about that question and what I advise is to find a, 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 to find a presentation that you can believe in too. And what I did with the pro-life activists, I told them, and I think it's true, that the abortion conflict in Italy has been studied a lot from the feminist point of view, but we lack studies about the conservative point of view, and I wanted to fill this gap in the literature, which I think it's true. So I could say that aloud without feeling bad, and that could also please them, because it gives value to their contribution into the debate. So it's something that can be heard from both sides. And last thing, I swear, is, <laughs> is try to find a common ground with people which is not political. For example, for the uh, pro-life uh, fieldwork, it was a lot of women, and I tried to connect it with the women on a gender base. And I just had uh, my second baby when I started the fieldwork. There was a lot of mothers. They were very happy. I can show baby photos, and I could connect with them on another on another. Uh, things that politics which can allow you to build some solid relationships that you uh, on other things as a conclusion um, I would say that ethnography of the extreme right is not like any other you have some specific challenges they can be positive because I think that as an ethnography of the right you need to be always reflexive and self-conscious. You can't just forget yourself as you can in other situations. They can be negative because the long term is difficult, very difficult. Uh, publication can be a problem. Giving a public talk can be a problem. You can be caught on the internet. So it really can be a problem. I published my first article uh, uh, as a, uh, uh, a synonym, a pseudonymous. Um, and I uh, ask young PhD students how much otherness can you stand before you engage yourself in this group. So I already talked too much. I just wanted to show a photo that I found on Facebook, me praying with the pro-lifers <laughs> on a ritual about aborted fetuses that get burial uh, in, in Italy as a way of protesting uh, abortion, so you also need to be prepared to find yourself on public platform doing this kind of, uh, of thing. Thank you very much, and sorry. Uh, I'll take uh, questions. It's sort of interesting because for somebody who's done long-term covert ethnography. It's very interesting to hear somebody who doesn't like it. Uh, okay, I, I, was, I was really taken by your phrase of uh, prisoner. Uh, becoming prisoner. And, I, and when I first saw it on there, I took it in a different manner than, than the way you presented it. And wondering if that's, if there's anything in your experience that's like that. It's kind of uh, the Stockholm Syndrome mm -hmm. uh, version of, of, of being a prisoner. In other words, um, you know, getting if, if you go back to like, Sociology 101 mm -hmm. and, and, and you know, prisoner of the role, or so how you put it, you know, in role theory, at a certain point, if you, if you adopt something, you begin to identify with it and, and mm -hmm. emotionally have a, 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 a a connection to it, and, and in, in a way, uh, I, I asked this question in part because I kind of watched the Republicans in this country who have gone from being, you know, mm -hmm. anti-Trump to full Trump, and you know, to what extent is that real identification? What has that? What's it been like? So, do you have any uh, experience with you, uh, not necessarily with yourself, but with others? where anything like that has happened? Uh, I, I personally 
don't, but Pete Simi talked about one case. He, he said when he first started uh, doing research within Nazi skins, he met another grad student and he was doing the Nazi salute and he and Pitsimi wasn't so they were discussing together why do you do that, how do you choose, yes, no, what does it imply, etc. Except that the guys actually became a Nazi skin himself. Um, so uh, apparently he got caught uh, in, in, the, in the group, it, we call it getting native in anthropology uh, I really never felt the risk <laughs> for myself, but apparently it, it can exist. And the two guys working on Casa Pound, I, that criticized me because I didn't return the study to the Liga Nord. They, I, won't, I wouldn't say they became Casa Pound, but I think their, their book is really uh, presenting the group as a, move, a, a young movement, uh, it's really lenifying the the neo-fascist part of the of the group. So, but I don't know them, so I don't know if it was a compromise with the people because they allowed the publication, or if it was how they really felt. So I I, I don't know, but it, they seem fascinated by the by the group in a way. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, you started the talk with this phrase, ethnography without empathy. And then a little later, uh, you made this clear distinction of, I'm not going to call them idiots, you know, and that you're going to take them seriously. And um, I couldn't help but thinking of Arlie Hotchdom, who you brought up, who, um, you know, goes down south. And one of her big points is the need of building empathy walls. And she's gotten a lot of critiques of like, how far should we be, mm -hmm. uh, you know, empathetic towards this group. And I was wondering how, um, you think of drawing that line of when, as ethnographers, you might build an empathy wall, to use her phrase, or um, to keep that distance? It's, that's a difficult one, and the, the idea of not being, not having a mocking attitude without falling into legitimation it's always a tricky one, mm -hmm. uh, so I'm aware of that. Uh, I, I, I really love Arlie's book, but I don't believe in her empathy wall mm -hmm. thing, uh, mm -hmm. really. I mean, I, I, I believe I can now understand those people. Doesn't mean they are on the same side of the wall. I mean, they are on the other side of the wall, <coughs> clearly. Uh, even though I can understand why they are on the other side of the wall, I don't feel that I have crossed the wall. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do think it's important that we try to do that while we are in the field work mm -hmm. as a way of getting knowledge, mm -hmm. as a way of trying to understand their point of view. And I do think that we need their point of view if you want to to be able to criticize even politically. Mm. Uh, for example, just take an example, last week in Italy, in Verona, there was the World Family of, uh, the Congress World Family of, Con I, I don't remember, but the idea is the World Congress of Families, which is basically all the pro-lifers and all the mm. anti-LGBT in the world getting together, and they called it the World Congress of Families. Mm. And the, the press, and the left-wing movement and parties constantly criticized the uh, Lega Nord uh, interior minister, Salvini, because he uh, uh, not only welcomed the Congress, but went to speak there. And, he, uh, and they criticized him, not because he did that, but saying he's a hypocrite because he's divorced, he has two child from two different women, and now he goes out with a TV star, etc. So they were saying, oh, those Catholics, they are hypocrites, they are not true Catholics. And this line of critiques is totally useless because it doesn't take into account how they think. I mean, they don't care if he is a sinner. Uh, what they do hate, they, they care that he bring their agenda on the government. That's what they care. What they do hate 
are people, a politician, Catholic politician, they are good Catholics. I mean, they are uh, with the same wife, they go into the church, etc., but they don't act as Catholics in politics. Mm -hmm. That was, it's hypocrite, hypocrite for them, and that is what they hate. So the, all the critic of the left and all the media was about, oh, look, the people they are talking with are not good at Catholics, they, their morality is really, ha, 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 that's stupid. Uh, but that's were totally pointless, because this is not what they consider as hypocrite and problematic. They can accept sin, that's not the problem. But you have to act as a Catholic when you are in charge politically. That's what is coherent for them, not with whom you sleep. Uh, so you need to understand their values, even if it's only to fight them. Uh, so I do think that we, knew, we need to cross that wall to try to understand them, but the political reunification that Arlie seems to believe in, I really, I would like to believe in, but I really don't. Yeah, Martina, this was so interesting, and I think it really um, is applicable to even though I know you're arguing that it's specific to the right, I think a lot of this is really yes. applicable to ethnography and other contexts as well. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you more about is your 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 kind of rule. You didn't give many rules, but one of the ones you made for yourself is the no member validation. And I can understand your reluctance to change your findings or your manuscript in response to what your informants tell you, but I think maybe, I guess maybe I would call it maybe member checking. I mean, I think sharing your findings with your informants mm -hmm. and, you know, letting them tell you what they think you got right or wrong could be very useful, you know, almost as another source of data, and then they might tell you things that you're like, oh, they might have another explanation that is actually helpful to you in understanding. But if you feel like they're just trying to make things themselves look good, of course you don't have to take their criticism or suggestion or whatever. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that kind of rule. And no. also, side qu a follow-up question, um, have any of your uh, informants or research participants read your work, and what kind of response have you gotten? Um. For the first one, of course, it doesn't mean that I would, wouldn't talk with them. I mean, some of them, uh, those with whom I could have a more close relationship. Uh, when I was talking about uh, return the data, it's really more in a, when we can do that in an empowerment way or in a, uh, this is what I call an impossible, I mean, that's not people needing empowerment first because they have enough uh, and second I do not want them to be empowered so um, so that was I was calling uh, and give men give them the right to have a voice about my voice on that but of course it doesn't mean that I don't discuss things with uh, with some at least some of the uh, of the people of course it's also my ambiguity also sometimes prevent me to do that uh, so it's a price also to pay of this ambiguity of my position because yes. it yes and yeah I wanted to thank you first for your presentation because I think it was really interesting and it was also really interesting for me because um, uh, there is a discussion in Germany about ethnography and right wing structures since approximately one year I don't know if you've heard about it I mean it's a bit a special discussion I think and I think one point of the discussion is the um, question you also raised about the necessity of um, ethnography in these writing structures because in some projects you would gain the same results if you just make an analysis of the newspaper and I think the other point of the discussion is the self-reflection and I think that discussion started especially because there was one researcher or is one researcher, it's a female researcher, um, who did research in a right-wing extremist group, um, identitarian they are called in Germany, and um, she did, did uh, this ethnographical um, participatory, 
participatory um, um, observation and interviews, and she started an intimate relationship with one of the heads of the yeah, uh, of the organization. And uh, yeah, but since then there's a bigger discussion about self-reflection and how to keep the distance to the subject. And at the end, you said you will recommend your grad students um, or you ask how much otherness they could take. And I like would uh, suggest also the other way around to ask like how much sameness they can take or, much, or how much self-reflection because I think there are entanglements with power structures, with racism, with sexism also as a researcher because that's how you're raised and how you grew up, how you're socialized and um, when you don't take this way of self-reflection and also look like um, uh, what uh, if there's a fascination for example for the radical right, like what does it do with you and um, yeah, I just wanted to, it's more comment, not a question, but uh, I just wanted to add this, that I think that's an important part of this eth ethnographical work, also the self-reflection. Maybe you're right now that the right became more mainstreaming and we have a conference, the next conference about uh, this will become more a risk. Uh, until now, I found that students had more difficulties into getting close enough than into staying far enough. But maybe now the right becoming more mainstream. Maybe I will have to face. I don't think. I don't hope so. St stories like like this one uh, of people getting caught in the in the system. But I have to say, until now, it was quite the opposite. about what kind of advice would you draw on uh, from your research for uh, researchers applying this kind of methodology like ethnography studies or interviews also um, on not ugly movements. I mean, does your research tell also something about how to reshape our understanding of the field work with more sympathetic uh, relationships and also what are the new tools that you can suggest to use in the situation where internet is, is so pervasive? I mean, I guess when you started with the Leganor it was probably different, mm -hmm. but now would you use your name doing your fieldwork? Yes, for the first, the first question, as Deborah said, of course, a lot of things that I was saying maybe is exacerbated in the, the for the right wing, but it's also a question that arises in other kinds of field work and other kinds of political field work, and uh, and so I I, I I clearly think that there are have I can make links to other other subject, but for the second part is very complicated. Uh, life is <laughs> very complicated when I with the internet and even more uh, social media. Uh, so, uh, for example, my my Facebook uh, page is a false name. Uh, and during the film where I had another Facebook page with my real name, who actually was my false me. Uh, so my true me had a false name and my <laughs> true name had a false me. Uh, because in a way, social media is a very powerful tool to have contacts and to follow also people when you're away from the field, you can stay connected and follow up. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, you can just uh, publish things uh, that you would like to publish in a page. <coughs> if you have for like friends and LGBT friends in the same page, doesn't work well together. So, uh, so this is a real, uh, a real problem. We in, at the end of the month, we have the conference here at the Center of Right Wing Studies, and there are uh, PhD students from France working on the National Front. They have false identities. They present in Congress, in conferences, with false identities, uh, and, and it's really complicated. And already in 2001, one PhD student from Chicago, she was doing her PhD about uh, extreme 
extremist Jewish school in Paris and she was talking about anti-Arabic racism really explicitly talked to the kid in those schools except that the school sent someone to the conference and she was just kicked out of the of the fieldwork in the middle of her PhD which was a catastrophe uh, so it's really complicated to, to, to control the information uh, and of course it depends on which stage of the fieldwork are you, in which kind of movements are you. There are movements tolerating debate much, than, much more than others uh, and, and, and uh, it's true that it became really a, a big issue, the uh, ident online identity and you can't say you're somebody else when you have my age. I mean, maybe if you're starting PhD, you can say you're somebody else, although it's problematic. But um, at my age, I just can't. Uh, I have an institutional position, uh, so I, I just can't disappear. Uh, so, so uh. Last question. Uh, I enjoyed that a lot. Uh, the, um, you mentioned that um, Anthropology is more acceptable on the right. So, uh, do you know of any ethnographies on the left? Has anybody tried to come sneak into Berkeley and um, portrait of us? Yes, there's m much more close, uh, I mean, ideologically close people working on uh, progressive movements, that's much more, a much more common position. Although when I tried, it didn't work well for me, frankly, and uh, I found it very uncomfortable uh, because I, when, you, when you do ethnography, it's also you reveal things that are not always the one that the group want to reveal about itself. And if you do that with people you don't like, you don't feel very bad, but if you do that when people that you you like politically, uh, you can really feel uh, much more as a traitor uh, because you're revealing some things that are, I mean, they say they're like that, but actually, uh, like, okay, I, I, w I was working on a feminist group in a union, they were supposed to work horizontally, of course they weren't, uh, and no group work horizontally. So, uh, of course, y you have to say, ah, they do think they are horizontally, but actually, uh, when you do ethnography, you can clearly see the structure of power, and you feel bad because uh, you think they are doing a good job uh, <laughs> besides, but uh, it's your job also to, to, to show the contradiction between the, the, the public face and the internal uh, dyna dynamics. So, it, you have other ethical dilemmas when you work on people you like politically, but you don't need to create a false view. That's already, uh, I mean, I think it's more difficult afterwards when you analyze. It can be more easy when you are doing the field work. Well, we've come to an end, so please join me in thanking.